organizations, um, everybody else in the organizing committee, um, and everybody who's joined us from all over the world. We have a multilingual, multicultural, multinational audience, which is awesome um, in these times of uh, pandemic um, and doing things online. Um, yeah, thank you for this introduction as well and for inviting me to talk about um, this work. It sort of reminds you how much you've been studying these things and when it's time to talk about them, you have to be very, very selective, you know, as to what you uh, choose to, um, uh, to present. So um, today I'm going to go over some of uh, the research that you mentioned on, um, on aspect and, uh, and motion. I just need to um, figure out to see if I share my screen and my slides. Uh, right now, okay. Share. Good, so um, I just heard this little ping that reminds me, let's turn off my email because it's gonna be annoying if it keeps pinging all the time. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Good, okay. And then let me see if I can minimize this. Yeah, okay, fine. Put it up there. Right, okay. So yes, thank you once again for um for the invitation. Um I was really looking forward to this for, for some time. Um obviously, you know, got it through the cancellations and everything, but it's so good to to be here to um talk about it. I'm going to be looking at um, thinking in multiple languages. I'm going to be focusing in goal-oriented motion events. Just a little bit of, a, of an outline of the areas that I'll be covering. Um, I'll give a little bit of context first as to you know, where I'm coming from theoretically and methodologically you know, with this, within this sort of neo-Wolfian uh, linguistic relativity um, approach. Then I will um, provide some theoretical background regarding the typology that I'll be talking about, so grammatical aspect and um, how it relates to event construal. Then I'll talk a little bit about, I'll foreground the empirical findings by looking at a framework of learning called associative learning. Many of you uh, will not be strangers to, to it because it has been used in first language acquisition, but also in second language um, acquisition as well. So I think it's important to foreground some of the findings by looking at some key basic tenets of, um, of that framework uh, that will help us uh, perhaps interpret the findings. And then I'm gonna delve uh, right into it. So I will be looking at essentially what's, you know, it's always a continuum of course, when it comes to learners, but um, if we were to kind of uh, categorize them, I'll be looking at a set of naturalistic um, learners and functional uh, by multilinguals, as well as foreign language learners or classroom learners um, as well. I think it's important to, when considering the one, to consider the other, um, as well when we look at uh, event construal in its entirety. And then I'll be uh, finishing off with some conclusions which are not, I mean, they're more like questions for further research really or problems, you know, that, uh, that haven't been um, addressed. So let me just uh, go into um, the background. The background is a theory or the hypothesis of linguistic relativity. This idea that was proposed but most famously by Benjamin Lee Wolf and his tutor at Yale, Edward Sapir. And um, that's what goes something like um, language or the, the grammatical features of language affect our uh, thinking, our thought processes in predictable ways. So I've highlighted some aspects here of the original definition by um, Wolf from 1940, just to um, kind of foreground the empirical basis of it, so different evaluations of externally similar acts of um, observation. So essentially, you know already we get a flavor of what construal might mean in a relativistic uh, sort of um, framework. So different grammars point speakers to different evaluations of externally similar acts of observation. And so people are not um, equivalent as observers, but have different views of um, the world. Of course, um, as any student of linguistics might, might know, uh, anybody who's interested in uh, the philosophy of language might know this is not a new question or a new problem um, at all. It's been debated for uh, for centuries before um, Wolf. When it comes to, to second language learning and, and bilingualism, uh, it was anticipated almost 100 years before Wolf ever put forward anything resembling a hypothesis by uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, the philosopher of language, who is having here a conversation with, uh, with himself as any self-respecting philosopher um, would. So, he would get both views, right, in these quotes by von Humboldt. The, the restructuring or the, the shift to you, the learning of a foreign language should mean the gaining of a new standpoint towards one's uh, worldview. 
Um, so you're gaining a new perspective, a new way of, of thinking. If it is not always purely felt as such, the reason is one so frequently projects one's own worldview, in fact, one's own speech habits onto a foreign um, language. So here we have the entrenchment view or the, 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 the transfer view, the conceptual transfer um, view. He talks about speech habits. We can interpret that to mean uh, most commonly uh, speech accents, for example, but also we can draw the notions uh, put forward recently, for example, by uh, John Lucy of uh, semantic accents or conceptual accents, you know, when we are uh, thinking in, uh, in uh, speaking in one language, but uh, perhaps thinking in, um, in the other. Okay, so let me just uh, talk a little bit about the empirical basis of neo-Wolfian uh, research. Essentially, what I'm trying to do here is, is op uh, op propose an operation operationalization of what worldviews mean, what, what these standpoints mean that, you know, Wolf and, uh, and von Humboldt are talking about how they're interpreted in uh, modern um, cognitive science. So the, the basis of the neo-Wolfian um, approach is that essentially um, cognition is categorization. And there are two elements of so this, two basic tenets here. The first one is an observation made in, uh, from cognitive uh, science that categorization is the essence of human cognition. The famous quote by Harnad is to cognize is to categorize. The second key um, tenet here is by Nosovsky, similarity is the basis of categorization. So the main criterion for categorizing is uh, similarity between um, items. So cognitive behavior in this paradigm has often been operationalized along a continuum of cognitive tasks that have some kind of categorization component uh, within them. I've uh, put there on the slide some of the famous uh, neo wolfian studies by Lucy on grammatical number, Levinson on space, Robertson on color, and uh, Gennari and colleagues on, um, on motion events. So the classic methodological um, example here is the triads matching uh, task, where a participant is asked to match a target stimulus in the case of motion events, perhaps a video, with one of two stimuli that vary from the target in uh, systematic ways. So if you're familiar with Italian uh, typology, the distinction between manner and path in classic instantiations of this task, like in Gennari et al. 2002, you have um, a target video showing some kind of uh, motion by an agent, and then you have an alternate that resembles uh, the targets in the manner of motion, so running, for example, and another one that resembles uh, the targets in uh, the path of motion, so coming out of the room as, a, as opposed to coming into uh, the room, but uh, with, uh, with uh, the same manner. Um, and so you have to choose which one is, is more similar. And the assumption is that if two, two events are construed or interpreted similarly, then they will tend to be perceived and categorized as more similar in a triad matching task. So this kind of gives us a glimpse or a window into um, construal of, um, of motion events. Okay, so how does this work um, in practice? So here is the example I'll be uh, talking throughout uh, today, grammatical aspects and temporal segmentation of, um, of events. So the category that we're talking about is um, aspect, uh, which is an obligatory grammatical category in languages like English and Spanish. Um, so in uh, English, for example, imagine the, the following dialogue, Jenny's in the basement, and then somebody asks you, what is she up to? And then you say she fixes the shelf, and that sounds weird, at least to, to native speakers. You know, that's not the way that you would um, uh, put that into words. You would uh, instead use the progressive um, suffix there, ing, so she's fixing um, the shelf to denote that this action is happening right now. Um, this kind of distinction, however, is optional in languages like German, and uh, Swedish. Now you can still you can still refer to uh, progressivity, but you do it with um, adverbials, lexical devices, and so on. So the answer to the the question in the dialogue before would be she fixes the shelf, and then if you want to specify that it's happening now, you'd say right um, now. So that's the crucial cross linguistic uh, distinction here, one that uh, forces the speaker to denote that the action is happening right now. It's an ongoing action, and one that leaves this uh, optional to um, uh, to the interlocutor. I'm going to be talking about how this interacts with goal-oriented motion events. What are goal-oriented motion events? Well, here is a very, very uh, basic schematized example. This is a goal-oriented motion event. Some kind of you know, entity agent is moving towards um, a goal. So a ball here is rolling towards um, the square. Now, when you um, interpret this scene, when you construe this scene and you want to uh, refer to it, you can take different uh, um, options as to what you choose to, 
um, and code, you can simply focus in on the action and you can say ball is rolling. So you can take an immediate um, perspective and that's typically the pattern you find in languages that have um, grammatical aspects or you can uh, choose to take a more holistic uh, perspective and include the endpoint in your description. So a ball rolls to the square, a pattern typically associated with non-aspect languages. If we move on to uh, real stimuli, this is an example of the kind of stimuli that we use that come from Christiane Verstutterheim uh, lab in uh, Heidelberg. So you see um, two women are uh, walking towards um, building and um, you ask people to, for, for example, in one of the tasks to describe um, the scene and uh, what you find here is that the key distinction, the key uh, feature, grammatical feature is a feature of progressivity, you know, progressive, uh, the marking of progressive aspects. So if your language doesn't have uh, progressive um, aspects, then the event is by default viewed in its, entire, in, uh, in its entirety in a maximal or holistic, I'm, I'm using these terms interchangeably because you find that's how you find them in the literature as well, in a maximal or a holistic uh, viewing frame where you're where more prone to saying, uh, two women are walking towards or to a building. So you mention explicitly the endpoint. Uh, if uh, your language, uh, however, utilizes a progressive aspectual marker, then um, you uh, tend to adopt an immediate uh, viewing frame that zooms in on the ongoing um, phase of the event and excludes the endpoint. So two women are walking, or often in, in, the, in our data, we see descriptions like two women are out for a walk, you know, not even um, uh, verbalizing the, the, the type of motion that is uh, happening. Now, when it comes to descriptions, and this has been shown um, time and again in um, the past uh, 10 or 15 years, um, we know that um, when uh, speakers are asked to describe these events, speakers of languages that um, lack grammatical aspect, like German and Swedish, tend to mention endpoints a lot in their descriptions. In some of our own data, for example, we have German speakers when you know there's no discernible endpoint in the in the uh, image in the video they will still make one up the two women are walking there's probably a village somewhere that where they're going or you know, something like that uh, however speakers of english and, and uh, aspect languages do so to a lesser um extent they don't mention endpoints uh, as much in their descriptions and as i said these uh patterns like expression patterns tend to uh, correspond to the presence of grammaticized aspectual markers in, uh, in these languages. Um, the main question, however, from a neo gupian perspective is what happens when you have to construe events when, you know, in situations where you don't have to talk about them explicitly, you know, uh, what is your nonverbal um, cognition of, um, of events? So this is where this, you know, triad matching task um, comes in as a window into nonverbal um, representation or construal. So the setup here is um, exactly as in other classic studies of uh, linguistic relativity, we have a triad of, um, of stimuli. And because we want to, because the crucial distinction here perceptually is attention to the endpoint of the action. This is the feature that will manipulate perceptually in our video. So we have um, a video that we call the minus endpoint, the low degree of goal orientation, where there is an agent and they are walking. There, are, there, is, there may be a possible endpoint, but it's very, very far um, away from uh, the agent. And the video stops before the agent is anywhere near that um, endpoint. Then we have another video which we call the high degree of goal orientation video or plus endpoint um, video. Now here the agent is walking, so it's always the same um, action. The agent is walking. This time they reach um, the endpoint and they cross um, a boundary. And then we have um, a third um, clip that has an intermediate or medium degree of goal orientation. That's the target uh, clip where the agent here is um, is walking. She is sort of going towards a possible endpoint. You can very, very, you know, uh, plausibly imagine that uh, the car is the endpoint that is going to her car, but the video freezes before um, there's any indication that she will actually go uh, into uh, the car. So we ask participant is um, X more similar to clip A or to clip uh, B. So the assumption is that if you tend to construe this intermediate uh, event as something that uh, really uh, highlights ongoingness, then you're going to tend to uh, match it with clip A here, the sort of low endpoint video. 
all you see is two women that are walking along um, a trajectory. However, if you take a more holistic approach and you pay more attention to a possible endpoint here, and you think this is that uh, this is uh, equally the locus of attention as well as the action, and you imagine that the agent is actually going to reach uh, the car, that you may uh, then select alternate B as being more similar because then you interpret or you construe the event as something that has uh, a salient endpoint that is going to be um, reached. And the assumption is that the, the hypothesis rather is that speakers of uh, languages that lack progressivity like Swedish and German will be more prone to match the plus endpoint alternate. So this uh, clip here with the target scene um, X because they lack um, uh, the progressive marker than will speakers of plus prog languages like English and Spanish who will uh, uh, in turn a go for alternate um, A. And this is what we find when we um, run the task. And um, there are many different triads, of course, not just one triad, uh, 19 different triads repeated twice, so uh, 38 stimuli. And we see that we find uh, time and again robust differences between monolingual uh, populations. So here's an example from Swedish and uh, English speakers. And you can see that Swedish speakers, so this is uh, the vertical axis shows you the plus endpoint alternate selection. So uh, clip B in the previous. Um, slide that's always on dependent variable here. And you see that Swedish speakers that, uh, whose language lacks a uh, grammatical aspect tend to go for the endpoint alternate uh, more than speakers of, um, of English. So we have an indication that the nonverbal um, construal it could be related to the presence or absence of uh, progressivity in, uh, in these languages. Okay, so this is again, you know, methodologically, it's a it's a classic way of approaching um, uh, a question of linguistic relativity. You you look at um, a cross linguistic uh, pattern, then you devise this kind of um, experiment to get to uh, the underlying uh, representation or construal, and then of course the million dollar question. Every reviewer of every paper that I've, 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 I've tried to publish always asks, what is the mechanism? You know, what gives rise to to the effect? You know, why are these people you know affected by? Their, uh, their, their language in, in this way. One hypothesis that uh, we could put forward is that the mechanism is associative um, learning. And that's been proposed. Actually, I uh, first uh, came across associative learning as, aside from SLA uh, as related to linguistic relativity in a paper by Daniel Casazanto on, uh, on time um, concepts. And then he kind of tentatively said, that maybe associative learning is, is, the, is the mechanism, but associative learning does offer some key um, assumption that may be useful when thinking about uh, the learnability of, of construal in, uh, in second language uh, users as well. So one of the, the assumptions here is that changes in cognition emerge gradually as a function of the degree of exposure to specific form meaning associations which then become part of an individual's cognitive um, routine. So what does, let's unpack this a little bit. Representations then build up or emerge over exposure to a number of specific instances of association. So we have some kind of statistical learning um, going on here. The more routinized an association becomes, the easier it is to retrieve and utilize it for the purposes of um, event construal. So this is how we get linguistic relativity effects. They arise because simply because when we see scenes um, like that, we draw on the co-occurrence of um, the scenes that we see and similar scenes that we've seen before and how we tend to describe them in our um, language. And we construct a specific event in this way and we will counter a new event. We always take our previous our routinized pattern and we uh, map it into that in a top-down um, fashion to uh, interpret the, the novel um, event. At the same time, however, associative learning assumes that the system is very dynamic because we don't just learn a pattern, an event pattern in our first language, and that's it. You know, we, we, we don't learn anything else in our lives. We're continuously exposed to novel events throughout our um, lifetime. So poten the potential is there. Well, it's an empirical question, of course, but the potential is there according to, to the model for restructuring to, um, to occur. So we know, for example, from, you know, SLA uh, that um, the hypothesis is that the individual constantly updates the relative statistical weighting of the associations against new context and new instances of um, association. So the system does kind of work in a top uh, in a top uh, top down fashion. We would draw on our previous routinized knowledge, but also in a bottom up fashion. You know, new instances, new occurrences of, of uh, associations may restructure what we previously have in our uh, routinized um, patterns in our mind. So the question of interest from a second language learning perspective then 
concerns the extent to which construal is affected by the acquisition of novel four meaning associations in the second language and the factors that modulate the internalization of these um, associations. And this is really what, I mean, when we talk about learning a new pattern, really what we're talking about is internalizing novel ways of construing um, emotion uh, event. So in other words, construal is an emergent property of learning experience. Important to remember, you know, because when we look at patterns of learners on, on the screen or when we analyze them and we look at our bar graphs, it's important to remember that what we're looking at is a snapshot of a very, very dynamic situation. So it's important to, to think about that when we analyze our data and when we look at, at uh, learner variables that may uh, modulate uh, the behavior that we're seeing as part of our um, analysis. And this is a big question. What is learning experience? What are these variables, learner variables, you know, that come into play? Well, in first language development, it's easy to answer that. You know, repeated exposure to the ambient language environment has consequences for how infants construe a range of things like objects, color, space, uh, events, even based on statistical regularities um, in the inputs. And we have um, vast uh, literature, robust literature, at least to tell us that before children begin to use their, their um, uh, first language patterns systematically, there are no cognitive differences between them. But once uh, we can trace the usage of specific uh, grammatical patterns or lexical patterns that are known to give rise to cognitive differences, then we see uh, uh, differences, cognitive differences between populations of children that speak uh, different uh, languages. This has been shown in the domain of uh, grammatical number and objects by Lucy and uh, Gaskins and the domain of color uh, by um, Robertson and, uh, and colleagues as well. So this is you know, what Levison's quote here is saying is that when a child learns a language, basically what the child is doing is it's learning to categorize the world. It's getting its concepts and, um, and it's doing that because language, language invades our thinking because languages are good to think with. Languages give us ready uh, categories of, um, of experience. Now, for second language learners, however, the the story is far more um, complicated. The concept of experience itself can be manifested in, 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 um, in, a lot, in lots of interesting um, and varied ways. So a possible outcome of experience with the second language is increasing expertise or proficiency in the second language. And indeed, when you undertake um, any study of, uh, of, uh, of, of second language learning or acquisition, one of the variables that you're going to look at is uh, language proficiency in the second uh, language. But of course, such expertise can be modulated by a multitude of other instrumentations of experience. So proficiency itself is a function of, maybe a function of many different uh, things. So frequency of speaking a particular language, context of learning and use. So are you talking about naturalistic learners or instructed learners and different sets of assumptions can and have been made about uh, them. The language setting, are you talking about a second language user that is really immersed in a monolingual setting, whether it's a first language setting or a second language setting, or somebody living in a multilingual or bilingual um, environment and have to, to switch between the languages uh, frequently. Um, length of immersion uh, or length of stay in, the, in a specific speaking environment um, as well, and, uh, and so on. So before I go into um, the data, I just want to, again, you know, touch on, 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 on the specific, um, uh, on the conceptual dependent variable, if you like, of the studies that I'll be um, presenting here. I'm going to look at some data from, from learners in a minute, but before we look at data from learners, I just want to, again, you know, revisit the um, object of learning here. So what is being learned or restructured when we talk about, when we're talking about event um, construal in this instance, what's being learned or restructured is to use uh, Langacker's terms, different temporal viewing frames of a situation. It's more or less the, 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 the stuff I was talking five minutes um, uh, ago. So if we imagine an event unfolding um, in time, then um, one way to interpret or to, to view the event is under a maximal or holistic uh, viewing frame where the focus is on the endpoints of the action as well as the action itself. Uh, another uh, viewing frame is to is the, an immediate viewing frame that looks at uh, the phasal characteristics of the action, the ongoingness, for example, where the focus is. So in this way, the, the linguistic feature that is associated with what is being learned or restructured isn't really the object of learning itself. So I talked about you know, progressive aspect. Progressive aspect is a powerful cue towards interpreting or construing an event either uh, holistically or, uh, um, or in terms of ongoingness. 
so progress so it, the absence of progressive um, aspects tells us that well you're more likely to to construe the event in a maximal or holistic green frame the presence of progressive aspect then tells us that you're more likely to um, construe the event in uh, in a in a more kind of ongoing uh, uh, frame. So um, it's important to remember that you know when we uh, because we have to uh, to to consider later on you know what it is why is it so challenging for second language learners to to um, to restructure their cognition potentially. So the first study that I want to present in this framework. It comes from naturalistic learners of functional uh, bilinguals. It's a study that I did with um, Emmanuel Billund and Marcel Nostendorp in uh, South Africa. And so we look at um, L1 Africans, L2 English bilinguals in a, in a bilingual um, society, in a society where uh, this particular set of speakers use Afrikaans and uh, English in their um, daily lives. Afrikaans is um, a non-aspect language, unlike um, English. So obviously, we want to see how uh, uh, these different aspectual contrasts are going to be reconciled in the mind of the uh, functional bilinguals when it comes to um, attention to endpoints. So the task is always a sense, ABX uh, setting when where participants have to match um, uh, a target that has an intermediate endpoint with one of two alternates, one that has a kind of low salience endpoint and one that has a high salience uh, endpoint, the plus endpoint. Um, alternate. And what we find in this uh, bilingual uh, situation, in this bilingual, um, uh, functional bilinguals living in a, in a bilingual setting, is that the Afrikaans speakers seem, they seem to be patterning with the Swedish um, speakers from our previous study. So they tend to adopt a more a maximal viewing frame than the um, English um, speakers. Uh, however, that's not the whole story, because when we look uh, at the uh, variables of um, uh, bilingual experience, we find that frequency of uh, language usage is a moderate to strong uh, uh, predictor of endpoint uh, preference here in the Afrikaans speakers. So the more they use English in their daily lives, the fewer endpoints they select as the basis of categorization and vice versa. The more they use Afrikaans, the more endpoints they um, select. So. You know, if we hark back to um, our associative learning framework, already we have you know the the the, the um, effect of frequency uh, of of use as a key factor in um, in cognitive restructuring. What about then? Can you quantify that? So the next question that we ask here is: What if you speak multiple plus prog um, languages or aspect languages? Does that uh, does that have a cumulative um, effect? So here um, we are looking at um, native speakers of Kosa. Um, Kosa is a Bantu language, but um, the multilingual situation in, in South Africa is such that if you are a Kosa speaker, you're very, very lucky to be a multilingual speaker. And here, for example, in our sample, um, each person reports knowledge and use of an average of 3.4 um, languages. And so we tried to to record uh, in our questionnaire the languages spoken by the individual and then try to um, classify them in terms of uh, how, to what degree they they have a spectral contrast that we're interested in and, and whether they mark progressivity or not. It's very difficult with some of the, the Bantu languages because you find conflicting accounts in, in the theoretical um, literature. But anyway, we kind of settled on, on this uh, topological uh, classification here, where we've got uh, several languages that uh, plus prog, uh, Swati, Sesotho, Tetswana, and English, and then the minus prog languages, Afrikaans, Kosa, and, um, and Zulu. And we, we compare the, 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 the Kosa speakers with a previous sample of English and um, Afrikaans uh, native uh, speakers. What we find here is a pattern that is very, 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 very typical of uh, studies on functional multi multilingual, not just in event control, but in a, a number of, of different domains. That is this in-between behavior between the, the, the two native speaker or monolingual uh, norms, if you like. So here are Isikosa multilinguals are um, uh, basically, well, they, they look as if they're in the middle, as if they have some kind of amalgamation of concepts. Um, they, they don't differ statistically from either um, of our uh, different comparison points, the Afrikaans native speakers, or the English um, native speakers. So obviously the next step here in the analysis is to look at the variables that may underlie um, behavior. We looked at a number of uh, different things that may be relevant to our particular um, sample. Um, the things that came up are significant in our uh, regression model. The first one actually um, surprised us. It was 
whether they received English in primary um, school. And that was the most significant uh, factor. So English in primary school seemed to be the best predictor of, um, of whether they're going to construe um, events holistically or not. The second one was use of aspect languages. So, so this, is, this is actually what we expected. We expected use of aspect languages to be the primary uh, driver um, here. But it turns out that um, it's still a driver, but not the most significant one. It turns out that English in primary school is a significant driver. So from, from this study, we can say that, well, frequency of use remains um, a significant variable because the, the regression tells you that uh, both of these uh, factors are, are indeed operational and uh, contribute to the model in, in a significant um, way. So use of multiple languages with grammatical aspect does affect endpoint. Uh, preference, but language of primary um, schooling is important. So if it was, if it tended to be uh, English rather than um, Afrikaans, then you were, you're more prone to, to behave like um, English native uh, speakers. Okay, so the next question then that um, uh, we wanted to ask was, fine, you know, what then, can you modulate, can you affect the behavior of individual by changing the language context? So of course, one feature of uh, multilingualism is that you may behave differently depending on the on the on the interaction setting that you find yourself in. So um, the next question was whether language context of operation may affect um, event construal. Here we recruited semi-naturalistic um, learners. So there is there is some formal instruction, but a lot of the instruction actually is uh, naturalistic because they live in most of them live in the second language speaking country or have lived in the second language speaking country. We looked at um, German English bilinguals. German is a is a non aspect language minus prog language, unlike um, English, and we varied the language testing um, context So 15 German bilinguals German English bilinguals tested in the non English context and 15 German English bilinguals tested in a non um, German um, context. Uh, we carefully mapped the two groups so that they were both uh, of very advanced proficiency, comparable ages of uh, acquisition, length of stay in the second language speaking environment, and frequency of language use. And for comparison purposes, we also collected data from German and native speakers and English uh, native speakers as um, as well. And we, we did find the effects of, of context, as we were um, expecting, but we also found that the behavior of bilinguals is still kind of in the middle of the two monolingual um, uh, norms here. So bilinguals in the English context, so here the, the darker uh, shaded graphs, did not differ significantly from either monolingual groups. So even though they look as if they're very different from the German monolinguals, so that doesn't reach statistical significance. And bilinguals in the German context differ significantly from the English uh, monolinguals. So we do have some um, effects of, um, of context uh, here, uh, bearing in mind that still, you know, we can't say that there aren't any uh, effects from the, the first language to the second language and from the uh, second language to the first. We have both kinds of, of, of uh, transfer um, uh, apparent here. In data that uh, is unpublished because we're still carrying uh, our data collection here, we have um, looked at uh, um, the variable of age of acquisition more carefully by uh, yeah, crossing it with uh, language context. And what we find is for our early uh, bilinguals, we find this kind of a, a typical um, uh, in between or convergence pattern that has been found in other studies, uh, for example, um, uh, Eva Mill in with uh, with objects, uh, object categorization, and, and so on, where bilinguals kind of converge into um, a middle point between the two monolingual um, norms. Effects of context are uh, more apparent in our um, late bilingual, so we could we could be seeing some some effects of of uh, of of, um, of of context here, differentially affecting uh, participants depending on the age of onset set of uh, bilingualism. It's important to bear in mind this, this issue of, of conceptual convergence when we consider the possible cognitive end states or outcomes of, of foreign language um, learning that I will be considering in a minute. But first of all, let's, let's just take a step back. Let's take stock of where we are regarding um, naturalistic learners. So we see that some of our uh, basic tenets of associative learning are found to affect event construal. So uh, frequency of speaking a particular language. Check, we, we have found this uh, in two um, separate samples of, uh, of uh, different uh, constellations of languages. Context of learning and use operationalized as language context of operation in the experiment, but also language of primary schooling in one of our multilingual samples. Um, check. We didn't uh, test, I mean, this is another supposed variable is length of immersion has been found to be a significant uh, factor in other 
uh, domains of investigation like object categorization and color. Uh, we haven't tested for it um, in our in our sample um, yet. So that question mark that we just don't know um, if it's uh, if we, if it will have an effect. In in the samples that we have tested so far, we try to look for it. We haven't found it, but then we have controlled our samples more or less so that this variable isn't uh, doesn't present with a lot of variation to be able to exert any um, observable effect. Okay, now. Foreign language learners. Hmm, what are the challenges here? They're somewhat you know, different from naturalistic learners because first of all, I mean, that, in fact, let me start with a similarity. Generally, second language linguistic experience is subject to considerable individual differences. No two learner trajectories, no two L2 user histories are going to be identical or even similar. You know, you're gonna have a lot of variation in the type of input they received, um, whether they received it by whom and, and, and so on and so forth. The other thing to consider here is unlike children, unlike first language development, the L2 learner already has a rich set of conceptual categories associated with the first language. So there is already routinized past knowledge here that will inevitably interact with the new um, information. The other um, uh, side to this is that event construal, at least the kind of event construal that I'm talking about, uh, here, with regards to uh, progressivity and, and maximal and uh, 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 immediate uh, viewing frames, but also with regarding to the Talmian uh, stuff on, on manner and, and, and path, these are not obligatory features of the target language, right? So if you, if you don't use them in, in, in language or in your behavior, nobody's going to say, oh my God, you know, it's, it's ungrammatical. You know, it's, so non internalization has potentially minimal impact on interaction and uh, behavior. And related to this, the input is limited to the classroom when it comes to foreign language learners. You know, so if, if again, if we take an associative learning uh, uh, viewpoint here and we consider things like frequency in the input statistical learning and so on, well, you know, with foreign language learners, we're very, very limited. If, if the foreign language learning especially is happening in, in the, 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 the country where the, the learners come from, the first language um, country. So limited to the classroom, um, another chance encounters, as I call them, with a the foreign language, audiovisual um, uh, media exposure, internet and social media, literature and arts, proliferation of the second language as lingua franca. That, that last one actually is very important because, okay, yeah, if you're talking about English, then wherever you are in the world, uh, your chance encounters are going to be statistically uh, more than if you are, for example, studying um, Greek as a second um, language in, in, in the UK. You know, it, it's, so it's, it, it's, it's, you're going to get different kinds of different uh, amounts of, um, of inputs in your uh, ambient environment. And event control itself is really not explicit in, uh, in the input. So in, in a sort of traditional you know, um, foreign language classroom, when it comes to event control or to, to any sort of you know, um, things that are not, you know, formal linguistic features of, of, the, of the target language, there's no focus on form here, no noticing, no explicit feedback from, from the teacher to, to the student. In fact, it's debatable whether the teacher uh, themselves uh, are aware of the cognitive or conceptualization differences that different event construals may entail for, uh, for learners. And of course, it it's, it's becomes even more tricky because there's considerable variation even among native speakers. So it's bad enough that, okay, the teachers cannot be the, the sort of the models that the learners can, can look upon, you know, for, for these things, but even native speakers aren't, because again, these patterns of construal are optional. You know, for example, um, English speakers can, uh, when they, when they uh, describe motion events, a lot of the time they mention endpoints. It's not ungrammatical to mention endpoints in English. And of course, German speakers as well, or Swedish speakers may opt to omit an endpoint from their descriptions. You know, so these things are, are not really statistically very well defined in the inputs of um, foreign language learners, even when they hear native speakers um, speak. Okay, so our first study then looks at um, English learners of, um, of German, and we wanted to see whether, um, learning um, a language that uh, doesn't mark uh, progressivity will affect event cognition in our uh, participants. We had our um, two monolingual groups as point of comparisons and then 76 uh, learners of um, German, they were all uh, learning German at university. Well, in fact, it was students in our modern languages um, department. And if you are familiar with, you know, modern languages departments in the UK, you, you, you will know that there is actually um, a variety of experience with, with a second language, even with the first year um, students of, um, of that language. So we, we gave them the classic triage matching task and a linguistic background questionnaire to 
record some of the learner variables that we were interested um, in. So at first pass, you know, we'll look at our um, analysis of so the middle uh, bar here is the English uh, foreign language learners of German. They're exactly in between the two um, monolingual um, norms. I just highlighted the standard deviations here just to show the, that, you know, in the learner group, you always have a lot more variability than you have in the monolingual groups. But you also have respectable variability in the monolingual groups um, as well. We do have a significant main effect of group that's driven by the monolingual group. The L2 learner group did not differ significantly from either um, of the monolingual um, group. The other thing to consider here are demand characteristics during the experimental settings. So here, the task was given to the whole class um, after the German um, class and after completing exercises in German with a German uh, teacher uh, present. You know, so again, bearing in mind the effects of context that we found previously, you know, it's, it's worth uh, uh, considering here um, as well. So the next thing that we looked at is uh, the learners or the students by the year of study at university. Sorry, at university. So we separated them into year one students, year two students, and year four. Um, students. There are no year three students because they're supposed to be taking a year um, abroad in uh, in a German speaking country. And what we found was that the it was only the year four students really that um, were significantly different from um, English uh, monolinguals. The other groups um, were not. Um, so you could say that there is some restructuring in in, in the year four um, group. What underlies this uh, restructuring? As, as I mentioned, we're dealing with the heterogeneous sample um, here. So we look at several variables like proficiency, you know, time uh, spent in a German-speaking environment, age. Uh, we look at uh, L2 media exposure as well, interaction with German natives and attitudes to second language um, learning. And the only thing that can, comes up as significant is their second language proficiency. So the more proficient they are in German, the more endpoints uh, they are uh, prone to select in the, the nonverbal categorization um, task. As I said, surplus proficiency here, it was, um, we measure proficiency like in the, in the LEAP questionnaire, you have like, I think uh, six different, you know, uh, constructs that you ask participants uh, to, to rate themselves on, like listening, speaking, uh, comprehending, and so on. Um, then we wanted to uh, focus in on, 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 on the proficiency um, issue and on the um, foreign language learners uh, specifically. So we, uh, looked at a uh, subset of the previous data set, we only um, uh, selected people that have been exclusively instructed throughout the learning uh, trajectory, late childhood learners, uh, I think it was about the cutoff point was 11, mm -hmm. and no immersion in second language speaking um, countries, so primarily um, instructed. So we really divided up the remaining 63 um, L2 users uh, who began learning German through formal instruction into three um, groups based on the years of L2 exposure, with a short exposure group, a medium exposure group, and a long um, exposure um, group. And then we um, carried out our analysis again. So here, what we find is a significant main effect of group, um, the German monolinguals, and the long exposure L2 users uh, differ significantly from the other um, groups. The short exposure group is, is weird because they, sh they seem to kind of, you know, um, move away from the English monolinguals, but the medium exposure group are exactly the same as the English uh, monolinguals. So what is going on? It looks like a, a U-shaped um, curve. Well, we looked at um, uh, correlations between the endpoint preferences and, um, and, uh, and proficiency in each um, exposure group separately. In the short instruction group, we found no correlation with any variable. So, you know, we don't know what accounts for um, the, the minimal shift that we're seeing there. In the medium exposure group, even though they look exactly the same as the monolinguals of the first language, we actually find that there is a correlation with year of study at university and also that the, the correlation with uh, second language proficiency is, is at significant uh, at significance um, level. And then we find the classic correlations with proficiency in year of study in the long um, exposure uh, group. So from an associative um, learning perspective, well, learning a language in which the progressive phase of an event is not encoded, does seem to have an effect on the learner's event um, construal. Um, in short exposure learners, we find it's primarily L1 based, their event construal, but also some signs of, um, of shift. Medium exposure learners seem to revert to the L1 pattern. So here, you know, it would be like a classic case of resistant to restructuring, 
but then we do find correlations with um, proficiency and, um, and year of study at um, university. Long exposure learners appear to have shifted towards a second language cognitive um, pattern. So if we were to, I'm, I'm not saying it is, but if we were to interpret this as a U-shaped pattern in associative learning, then we could interpret the changes in short-term learners as a, as a novelty effect. You know, you've, you've learned a language that where all of a sudden, you know, the uh, uh, progressivity isn't highlighted. Um, and then regression here is not really regression, but more of a consolidation effect. So uh, we have a marginally significant correlation with second language uh, proficiency. And finally, a shift in uh, long term learners where you have internalization of the second language uh, viewing frame or, um, or pattern. OK, so um, then we looked at uh, Swedish learners of English. I'm aware of the time. I will, I will try to leave a few minutes for, for, um, for questions. Um, so here we looked at um, the reverse pattern. Before we looked at English learners of, um, of a minus prog language, now we're looking at uh, Swedish uh, learners of, uh, of a plus prog um, language. We had eight to um, Swedish speakers. They um, had received classes since the third or fourth year of primary school and throughout secondary um, school. 36% of them had studied English at university um, level. They were all very, very advanced. Uh, speakers of English, and we have English monolinguals as a comparison um, group. We gave them um, a language background questionnaire that specifically probes into um, foreign language learner variables like radio, television usage, books, newspapers, magazine, and the internet in the second um, language. Um, once again, you know, we find this classic in-between pattern. Uh, our learners are in between the English monolinguals. This is the Swedish uh, graph bar from our previous study with Swedish speakers. In this particular paper in, from 2015, we only have uh, foreign language learners and English speakers. But in any case, you know, we see that um, they, the, the learners differ significantly from uh, the native speakers of their second uh, language. And we looked at our um, regression. The only variable that came up as significant was exposure to second language um, audiovisual media, specifically television. So that seems to have an effect on the degree to which they um, construe um, events. Well, we have, I mean, proficiency is kind of there's a little, a small, very small trend, but it's way, way, way off um, significance. Uh, levels and yeah, even age of uh, age of onset. So exposure to audiovisual media seems to play um, a role um, here. Um, so it can be assumed that you know English speaking audiovisual media um, it could be operating in two ways here. The first one is that it contains reduced verbal references to endpoints, so in the linguistic input, but also less visual prominence to endpoints when depicting uh, motion. It's a hypothesis, right? This is not a laboratory study. We didn't manipulate. Uh, the motion in, in 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 the exposure at all you know we don't know what exactly is is going on um but we can under associative learning perspective we can hypothesize that repeated exposure to uh, this kind of construal over time will lead to a routinization of this immediate or ongoing viewing frame in the mind of the second language um speaker so that these frames then you know are frequently applied to categorize uh motion event scenes Okay, well, I had one last study to present, but I can I can do that or I can ju jump straight to the conclusions. What do you think, Freibet? Um, should I uh, do that very quickly or try and wrap up? I can't hear you very well, I'm sorry. Hello? Let me just briefly take over one from private. <laughs> Uh, so maybe it's good if you, if you start wrapping up so that we leave yes. a little bit of time for a conclusion. Yes, exactly, exactly. Perfect. Okay, so uh, in that case... Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's a good uh, point to, to wrap up, I think. Right, so can event control be learned or restructured? Well, the study I left out actually um, was a study on learning per se. So there we actually manipulated, you know, um, the, the inputs and we, we um, gave participants a task that essentially gave them feedback on the categorization. They had to categorize based on endpoint saliency or, or non-endpoint uh, um, saliency. 
and, and, and we found learning in, in both um, conditions. So some in initial observation, uh, frequency and use of context of operations seems to affect um, event construal in, in semi-naturalistic learners and functional bilinguals. Uh, length and type of exposure affects outcomes in classroom learners. So we've seen this with our English learners of German and also with our Swedish learners of uh, English. Audiovisual um, exposure particularly seem to play um, a role. A novel pattern of event construal can be learned in control settings via the perception of visual route. This is the experiment that um, I've left out here. Uh, is a paper with Dan Albright in uh, in language learning in in uh, 2016, where we found that actually you, you can you can teach people uh, English uh, speakers to pay more attention to endpoints, but the way you, you teach them that is not through language; it's purely through vision. If if you if you think about the um, Badley's working memory model, uh, you go through the visual spatial scratch pad rather than the phonological loop, you know, to teach them the distinction. So visually, perceptually, you know, they they can. They can uh, shift their attention towards um, endpoints. So yes, so a novel pattern of event control can be um, uh, taught in this way. And so all these lend potential support to several, um, uh, also some specific methodologies. For example, you know, the efficiency of multimodal pedagogies in language um, teaching, uh, the use of you know, um, audiovisual uh, material and, uh, and so on as a tool for, for learning conceptual uh, distinctions in a second language. Uh, feedback, feedback driven uh, learning in cognitive linguistic pedagogical approaches like image schema based instruction. And um, again, that comes from um, this experiment I just described, where you uh, have participants perform the triad matching task, but this time you give them uh, feedback, and the feedback seems to divert their attention towards the desired um, outcome. Issues to consider, and by that, issues to consider, I mean, let's not repeat the classic mistakes of SLA <laughs> of the past, which um, I think they are that, well, I mean, first of all, we need to, we need to, to look at uh, L2 users or learners in, in comparative perspective, you know, looking or considering having in the back of our mind, you know, possible outcomes uh, for teaching as informed by the different varieties and different situations of second language um, learners. learners um, we see, for example, that patterns in our naturalistic learners of functional uh, bilinguals uh, tell us that both languages may, by default, be operational in event construal, this classic in-between uh, patterns. So perhaps this should be the baseline or target for classroom learners rather than monolingual speakers of either um, language. And this kind of this leads us to this multi-competence um, view proposed by Vivian Cook. Uh, they need to study L2 users and learners in their own right. So rather than assuming a cognitive end state, it's what you said, the, the goalposts, essentially, you know, rather, rather than the goalposts being set with monolingual patterns in mind, perhaps it may be more useful to focus on the variation that learners themselves exhibit and unearth the variables that underpin such um, variation. And just, you know, my last slide is this, you know, I, I really love this quote. I came across it recently in um, a very, uh, well, not very old, uh, in, an, in an old article by uh, Jean-Marc de Waal and Eta Pavlenko talking about the multi-competence view of second language learning, two liquid colors are blend unevenly. Some areas will take on a new color resulting from the mixing. Other areas will retain the original color, but others still may look like the new color, but the closer look may reveal a slightly different hue according to the viewer's angle. So we have a mosaic you know, of different um, uh, outcomes here when it comes to second language uh, users. And I think that's it's important to bear in mind. And yeah, some of my collaborators and acknowledgements of, uh, of the funding. And thank you all so much for bearing with me. And we even have a few minutes for um, questions, so I will stop here. Thank you very much, Panos. Can you all hear me well? Yeah, I can hear you now. Thank okay, you. thank you very much for such an interesting talk. We have already some questions. Ones are um, typed in the chat. Uh, if you want uh, to uh, ask any question as well, you can use the videos and raise your hands first, okay? so. Um, I'm going to start. Norbert says, thank, thank you, Panos. Always inspiring to hear about your work. My question is about cognitive restructuring and low level processing. What is your take on the possibility of restructuring manifested in automatic perceptual processes, like what you report in Flecken et al. 2015? In neural responses with L1 speakers. Would you expect to find effects on this level with L2 learners? Thank you. So, yeah, thank you, Norbert, for, for your uh, kind words as well, and, and also for the interesting um, question. I, I think, 
I think that um, such effects, you know, are are can, can be can be manifested again if you think about um, about the system being dynamic. So there's nothing to to say that we won't be able to find effects of low level uh, restructuring. We've seen this in the domain of color in terms of loss. So um, in in one of our studies, you know, Greek uh, English bilinguals. Are, are losing their, their first language distinction over two different blues. And you can see that in, a, in a, when, you, when you look at their um, uh, perception patterns, you know, the, the, the brain activity. Um, in motion events, I have to say, it's very, very difficult to come up with a, a really good paradigm to study low level perception. I hope, I hope you, you come up with, <laughs> with, with one, you know, we'll hear from you um, soon. So, yeah, with, with a study with, with Monique Flecken, for example, who came up with a schematized, you know, way of, of looking at, um, at motion, you know, and we, we did find some, some differences. Um, I, I have no, you know, I don't know whether that will be the case for learners as well and whether, you know, you can show um, any effects there. But with learners to begin with, I, I would first start with more high level uh, uh, processing, you know, just, just to see whether it's possible, for example, you know, via perceptual, um, learning, it's, it's possible for them to, to, to think, to see the other pattern, if you like. And ha having started with that, then I would go into the more kind of low level um, stuff that you're talking about. Yeah. Thank you, Panos. Another question from Katharina. Uh, thank you for this interesting talk. You mentioned multilingual speakers with the main distinction plus or minus proc and learners of these languages. How do learners perform in language learning, especially when the languages differ in the absence or presence of aspect? For example, it is easier for the native speakers of English, sorry, um, sorry, uh, for a native speakers of English to learn Russia in terms of viewpoint aspects, since both languages express aspect grammatically although the systems are very different, or it, is it easier to start from the beginning and acquire English aspect with a non-aspect mother tongue such as German? I think that if you, yeah, that's, that's a really good question, thank you. So I think that if you're talking about the formal linguistic feature, you know, the actual aspectual forms, I have no idea. Um, I don't know, you know, what, what the case may be, but if we're talking about the, the, under, the, the underlying event um, construal, the, the more conceptualization stuff that, that we're interested um, in, then I think that having already uh, aspects in your, in your arsenal, you know, you, you, you may assume that you, you're going to be um, affected by by learning um, another aspect language. Maybe it's maybe it's easier, you know, if you if you think about the the findings that we have from um, Afrikaans, from our, uh, sorry, from our Kosa multilinguals, where we see that the number of aspectual languages they speak actually correlates with you know um, uh, lack of attention to to endpoints. So it seems to have an, a cumulative effect there. So you could assume that yes, once you have the concept of of ongoingness in your um, in your language then, um, you know, learning another language may not be as, as difficult, at least at the, conceptual, um, at the conceptual level. But I think it's an empirical question. You know, it's something that needs to be, if, if it already hasn't been looked at, it needs to be looked at in, in a study that will actually manipulate uh, uh, learning backgrounds in a kind of contrastive um, way, you know, having learners that, whose language um, uh, corresponds with a second language and, and another group of learners whose language differs from, from that. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it would be an interesting study. We have uh, two minutes, one minute for uh, maybe one quick question. Does anyone would like to ask something? Another question? I think there's a question from Renan. Sorry, I didn't see it. Could you read it, Janine, from Sure. Um, well, how do you think speakers of uh, minus progressive Russian, which however has a very complex motion verb system with prefixes and perfective imperfective verb? Um, the next bit of the chat. <laughs> Uh, doesn't it, that's all I think that's the it's whole question enough. I think I, I think I can, I can I can put it together so okay how, <laughs> how, 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 yeah. so 
what if you have a language, you know, that, that doesn't have uh, the, the same kind of uh, uh, topological instantiation of aspect, but nonetheless, we, uh, uh, encodes aspect in, 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 in different ways, in, 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 in very sophisticated uh, ways as, uh, as well. Well, again, you know, I think that, I think that it's, it's, it's as long as it is encoded in, in these kind of rigorous ways, there's no reason to assume that there won't be an effect. In fact, even if a language doesn't have, you know, formal grammatical obligatory um, aspect, but has a special, final spectral distinctions uh, by lexical means, um, I don't see why, you know, the speakers of that language wouldn't be affected by um, by that. So um, I think I think it's a matter of, of degree, you know, how many linguistic, that's why I, I said at some point in, early in the talk, you know, we think of grammatical aspect as a cue towards construal, not as the defining feature, not, not in a kind of rigid topological way. If your language has aspect, then you, grammatical aspect, then you perceive motion events in this way. So I think if you see it as a cue, then you, you can see it as one of many other cues that could be available in a, in a language to draw your attention towards ongoingness or towards um, uh, completion. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Panos. Thank yeah. you for that really interesting talk. Uh, so we have to move on to our next uh, um, talk. So some applause. <laughs>